It is my honor to share with you a sacred man who is one of the most spirited, soulful men who lives today. He's deeply connected to Mother Spirit, to Mother Water, to the oceans, to the land, and to really bring all of our hearts together. Kalani is, I think, a reverend. Is that right, Kalani? <laughs> And he lives in the Big Island of Hawaii, and as you will get a chance to experience from him, has such a deep connection with all of the resources, all of the gifts and the blessings that we are given by Mother Nature with so much generosity and so much abundance. So I welcome Kalani to share with you his wisdom and the water blessing. And just a reminder, can everyone make sure you have your uh, water, glass of water, so you can raise your glass um, for the blessing. And if you don't have it, please take a moment to go get your your glass and, and have that. And in the future, you'll know that if you can just make that be your standard uh, procedure to always have the water by your side and that we will always start with honoring and sharing our gratitude for all the gifts that water gives to us. <laughs> I, I didn't even know who he was talking about. I mean, I'm mostly irreverent most of the time. <laughs> and humble. Everybody comes to here in their own fashion. My grandfather tells me once, he says, you know, nobody gets out of here alive. <laughs> It's just a matter of how you do the journey before your breath joins with the atmosphere and the water in your body returns to the woman that is the sea, you know, and, and the 11 pounds of mineral salts that are left, you know, go back to the earth mother and you sort of disassemble. You know, it's a, it's like maybe that's why deconstructed food dishes are all the rage. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we're getting closer to the truth about us as walking bags of water. But you know, like I said, irreverent. You know, Hawaiians say there's three families, three families you get to experience in your life. You know, the first family. Is the family you're born to. It's kind of a karmic agreement, you know, from a long time ago, or even from the future. And those people in that first 14 years, some of us 20 years, 21 years, that first group, they're here to teach you something. Teach you something about yourself. <laughs> Not all of it nice. But there you have it, family. You know, then you have the family you choose. You know, that kind of happens somewhere between 14 and, like, who knows. <laughs> right when you step out and you have all those relationships and your first lovers and your, and your husbands and wives and partners and people you decide to family with and your best friends to keep with you close all through your life. The family you choose. And they're here to teach you something about yourself and your relationship to others. And then they say, you have the family you're never without. Mm -hmm. You know, the grandfather son and the grandmother moon and the sky father and the earth mother and the woman who is the sea. The woman who is the sea, she's the young ingenue. She's the younger sister of the great-great-great-grandmother. In fact, they say she's the reincarnation of the great-great-great-grandmother, who we call Pope, who comes from the darkness of space, one drop at a time. My grandfather used to say, you know, the woman that is the sea, 
who was the grandmother, came from space one drop at a time, in case you think you know what patience is. Hmm. I want you to sit at the ocean and think about that one drop at a time. Hmm. Me, I figured just, you know, put the whole picture in one time, just get it over with. Who knows how the water got here? The old stories say, from the deepness of space came the water, older than the sun, older than the sun. Mm. I remember having an argument in 1976 at University of Texas Arlington about the water being older than the sun. You know, they proved that the water is 7.2 billion years old. The sun is only 5.4 billion years old. What's up with that? <laughs> Right, so what came first? So, here's a blessing. Here's a prayer. Something to ground ourselves and get us centered on what matters. You know, have that glass of water standing by so we can hoist it to the spirit in the water so that I can get the prayer to the glass. And then take the water within myself. And it can go through and hit every cell and every cell wall of my 99% molecular weight water little saran wrapped bag and fabric and skin that run around these little sea monkeys. You know, <laughs> got a little layer of fat underneath the skin. Must have spent a lot of time in the water compared to the other primates eating little shellfish on the shore, getting the omega-3s up above the omega-6s and creating whole new capacities. Thank you, water. Mm. Mm. One final thing. Those of you who think you're in a relationship in water, uh, hey, you should be drinking half your body weight minimum in ounces of water daily. So for example, if I'm a buck 60, 160 pounds, and I should be drinking 80 ounces of water a day, minimum. I bet most of us don't drink that amount of water for our body. So it's a prayer for you and a prayer that you start drinking more water. <sighs> Thank you for the song 
and thank you for the dance, and thank you for the time to heal and make it right. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the great creator and the spirit that is in the water. Mahalo ke aku. Nauhanei kawai. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you, Kalani. You are, a, you are a blessing and a gift, my friend. Well, Isabel, <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm going to just say, yeah, I'm just going to say real briefly that Isabel is an extraordinary woman, and she is a leader in the water industry. She has a voice. She has a mind. She has a heart and a soul, which is so rich, so beautiful, and so powerful. And you will get a chance to experience and taste and be bathed in her wisdom and her gifts that she has to share with you today. So deep gratitude and reverence to Isabel for joining us and for sharing what she has amassed and studied so deeply in understanding water and really bringing water's message forward. I'll let you take on the spirituality of water. Thank you, Isabel. Oh, Do you need to have permission? Madeline, do you need to give Isabel permission to share her screen possibly? Okay. Sorry, I was muted. It's that it is such that everybody can share. Great. Okay, here we go. Can you guys see that? Mm hmm. I love that image, Isabel. That's one of my favorite. Woof. All right, guys. Well, it is such an honor to be here with you. I really appreciate it. Um, as Stuart said, I'm Isabel Friends, and today we are going to dive into the true nature and the profound possibilities that are inherent in water, specifically when we get to know water as a living, sentient being with her own autonomy and her own um, will and needs and desires that are not much different from our own. So this is really an invitation to meet water in a new way. So understanding the true nature of water can really unlock this reciprocal spiritual so where we tend to the health and vivacity of water, and she in turn creates health and vivacity in our bodies, in our habitats, and in our ecosystems, in all ecosystems, because really that's what water naturally does, right? When we get out of her way with pollution and diversion and dams and extraction and, and processing plants and all of that, this is what water does. She tends to the creation and renewal of all of life. All by herself, that's her role. And our role is to facilitate her capacity to do so. As Schauberger said, the true foundation of all culture is the knowledge and the understanding of water. And yet, as Dr. Bokov, who is a biophysicist, said, we know almost nothing about water. We know almost nothing about water. Does that surprise you coming from a biophysicist? I mean, we, we kind of tend to have this assumption that water is just this super simple uh, molecular substrate, right? It's a solvent, and, and it's pretty simple and ubiquitous. And so we treat water as though that's true. We treat water as though its quality is merely a measurement of its quantity. In other words, how many contaminants are present. And if we decontaminate it, then that must be healthy water, right? But that's actually so far from true. 
the molecular structure, the crystallinity, the hydrogen composition, the hydrogen isotope composition, the aeration and oxygenation, the flow form movement patterns, the temperature gradient, the electrical conductivity, all these are far better measures of water's health and her capacity to facilitate life processes and to bring that health into ecosystems than just how many contaminants are present. So we really have to shift our understanding of water. And this, this is the shift. It's recognizing water is the body of life. Water is the body of life. When life itself wants to take on physical form, it does so through the body of water. And just like our bodies, Water has similar needs. Water needs to breathe just like we need to breathe. She needs to move just like we do. She needs energy just like we do. And without these, she starts to get sick and go dormant just like we would, right? We are just bodies of water after all, like Kalani so eloquently explained. But our modern treatment of water deprives her of all of these different factors. And so the resulting water is dormant, devitalized, comatose, empty, hungry, often aggressive, and we're seeing the results of that all over the world. So let's explore what starts to shift when we start to unlock this relational paradigm rather than an objectifying paradigm. This is what it all comes down to, relational rather than objectifying. Because we won't protect what we don't love, we don't love what we don't know, and we can't know what we haven't learned, as one of my favorite writers, Stuart Chet Myers. So for our ancestors, this relationship was foundational, right? For indigenous people, it is still foundational, but for the modern Western colonized mind, it's something that we need to cultivate and to remember. And thankfully, water already remembers, right? And she can remind us. We can learn directly from her. In fact, the word remember comes from the Greek word mem, which means water. So she is a source of wisdom, a source of memory and teachings. She is the wise mother that we all share, like Kalani shared with us. She is the wise mother. She is she is the woman that is the sea. Again, most of the water we know is denatured, devitalized, and divorced from the hydrological cycle, divorced from her own life cycle. So rather than making our blood from the lifeblood of the watershed, which weaves our bodies into our local ecology. Instead, we purchase our blood from governments, municipalities, corporations, dispersed all over the planet. We're making our, our blood from Fiji and the Alps and Evian, France. Now, the water you drink becomes your blood within five minutes of drinking it. So if you're paying uh, for tap water and, and you're making your blood of that, you're paying the government for your blood or you drink uh, bottled water, you're drinking you're, you're paying a corporation for your blood, but all of our ancestors for hundreds of thousands of years, even before we were homo sapiens, or as Stuart would say, aqua sapiens, we have been making our blood from the place where we are. Imagine how much more grounded and gentle you are making your body water of the body water of your local ecology. So how can we be effective guardians and caretakers of something that we don't even have a personal relationship with, something that we are not physically, much less emotionally connected to? Because there's no relationship that's more personal than what's flowing through your own way. That is a huge intimacy that we re-establish the primacy of that intimacy. So what comes with that remembrance? What comes with re-establishing a more ancient and really more human relationship with the source of life. When our very blood is woven into the west of our habitat, how does that automatically position us as better students, stewards, and students of life itself, and what it's like? So beyond the modern anthropocentric questions of who controls water resources, or how is water distributed, or how, how is water uh, who has access to water, there's an even bigger question, more that's at the heart of all of it. But can we learn directly from water herself? So before we can learn directly from her, just like with any relationship, we have to meet one another, right? Before I can learn from you, before you can teach me, I want to know where you're from, what's up, how are you doing, right? So who is what? 
She's living in a There are over 64 anomalies about water that scientists still can't explain. Ways that she behaves uh, completely counter to the laws of physics. For example, she is the only substance on Earth that is naturally found in all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, and in fact, the fourth phase, which is plasma. Uh, we often call the crystalline uh, allotrope of water or structured water. We call that the fourth phase. Technically, it's an allotrope, not phase. Um, but regardless, she's found in so many different states naturally. She's like off in the sky, right? She's the ultimate transformer, constantly transforming. And it's through her transformations that every life process is able to take effect on Earth. She has immense surface tension that <laughs> baffles scientists under certain conditions. She can have implied strength of steel. There's a, an experiment called the Water Bridge Experiment. You can check out if you want to learn more about that. Under certain conditions, in the quantum tunneling state, she has a really profound Bridge National Laboratory, ORNL, that found that in this quantum tunneling state, water can pass through solid walls, and water molecules can bilocate and even sex to locate, meaning that the same water molecule can occupy multiple locations in space at the same time. And unlike anything else that's been studied in a quantum context, water is capable of quantum feeds, even at room temperature, as shown by Dr. Louis Montagnier in, in his experiments. Rest in peace, he just passed away last week. Um, so everything else that's been studied in a quantum state, you have to have, what, like absolute zero in the laboratory and, I don't know, vacuum conditions and all this, this crazy coming up, but water defies the laws of physics, and she would have to do so, right? In order to, to be that which sustains life, she would have to transcend everything else in the universe. She would have to be the most vacuuming thing that is. Um, and all of these happens uh, enable her to be the source of life. She also behaves with quantum coherence. So coherence is basically just the ability of uh, many disparate pieces to act cohesively as one unit. So for example, if you have a fabric that's made with 10,000 different threads, because they're woven together in a certain pattern, that fabric acts cohesively as one unit. Or your body, even though you are a multitude of molecules and cells and organs and, and nerve fibers and all of it, they act cohesively as one unit, and you're aware of yourself as being one being. You have this quantum coherence. And when water is structured, when she's in that crystalline allotrope that we talked about, she has this quantum coherence cohesively as one intelligent being. Also quantum entanglement, meaning one water molecule can communicate with another water molecule regardless of distance, say even regardless of time because of her connection to quantum field. She is also an infinite fractal of information storage. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Dr. Rustin Roy, who says that water is the world's most beautiful computer. And even though that makes her sound incredibly like an inanimate object, I feel like it's a useful analogy just for us to have some sort of... Um, analogy to understand her computing capacity, which is incredible. Um, so the smallest units of measurement that we've been able to measure, I don't know if this was an electron force microscope or an atomic force microscope, uh, but the smallest unit of measurement that we can measure, according to that, water has 440,000 panels per cluster of water models. Now, understanding the fractal in nature of water, if we had more advanced instruments, we would be able to see that actually each one of those compan those panels is subdivided into smaller panels, and each one is, is basically an infinite fractal. So we could say she has an infinite number of panels per cluster of water molecules, and each one of those panels is responsible for sensing, storing, transducing, and transmitting information, vibration, and frequency. This is why many ancients considered her to be the universe's sensory organ, the way that the universe sees and hears and smells and tastes and feels, it's through the sentience of water. And something that is really fascinating, and we won't go into this presentation, but I highly recommend looking into, it's kind of really hard to find information about it, um, but water alone can become a fire. 
in its plasma phase. We call it a flaser or a fluid laser. And even though you can put your hand right by it and not feel any radiating heat because it's implosive, you can burn through like solid concrete with it. And it returns things to the crystalline state and returns things to uh, its into a water state. So everything comes from water, eventually everything returns to water again. So for example, you can um, take, uh, you know, pollution in the environment and under the right conditions with plasma water, you can, you can return that pollution back to a state of water again. So there's enormous potential with that particular phase of water. So water, who is she? She is the true teacher, the master, the guide, and the sage. It is the life force of consciousness comprising the very substance of life itself. It's been said that water is not a resource. Water is the source of life. But water isn't even just the source of life. It really is life. Water is life. And she's smarter than us. So mm -hmm. as you can see... From this, the further that we break matter down into its component parts, the more potent the frequency spectrum becomes. So, like the nucleus measures a higher frequency spectrum than the atom, and the element within a molecule also is a higher frequency spectrum than the molecule itself, and the molecule is higher than the cell, and the cell is higher than the organ, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in this case, energy as information is what we're calling intelligence. So, energy as information equating to intelligence, which means that well, other molecules within us carry more information or intelligence than we do, and we get to tap into that wellspring, that wellspring of infinite wisdom. Because remember, you know, just like Kalani shared earlier, you're only 70% water by volume. Well, around 90% water by volume when you're a baby, and then maybe around 50% by the time you're an elder. In fact, it's been said, like Dr. Um, Ishahari Yumi said that water, that uh, aging is really just a process of drying out. That's really what it is. Um, so both, uh, volumetrically, you're 70% water, but by molecular count, molecularly, you're 99.9% .9 water molecules. It means that for every thousand molecules in your body, 999 of them are water. So we are bodies of water. And the liquid life has the answers to life's toughest questions. When we shift our relationship to water from a resource to the source, then we can humble ourselves. We can listen and we can learn. And I think that's really the decolonization that needs to happen in our mindset. The Western mind likes to set itself, you know, above everything. You know, we, we have the answers and if we don't have them, we'll figure it out. Right? Well, it's time to really humble ourselves. To listen and learn. So what can we learn from water? Let's look at energy, medicine, um, agriculture, and climate change. And just in those areas, let's see, once we shift this relationship, what can we learn? So, in the realm of energy, as Thomas Huxley said, water is as powerful as a thunderbolt. And as Victor Schauberger said, more energy is encapsulated in every drop of good spring water than the average sized power station is presently able to produce. So our issue with energy is how can we provide clean, low cost, accessible energy to everyone on the planet? Sounds like an insurmountable task, right? Well, the shifted relationship, the paradigm shift that's necessary, is Recognize that water is the source of all life force energy in nature. As you said, water is the driving force of nature, the driving force, the power, the engine of nature. Specifically, spiraling water. So specifically dependent on her movement patterns and on her temperature, as Schauberger described in his work. So, you know, how are plants able to grow according to the Fibonacci sequence in five spirals? Because that's the way that water moves. That's the way that she vortexes. Or, um, you know, how how do does the solar system never run out of energy or suffer from entropy? Because it works based on these these spiraling, vortexing, implosive patterns. When we're working with implosion, we don't get the same energy wastage that we get from explosion. Nature uses explosive, 
heating, radiating heating forces when it wants to decompose and decay and break down. And yet, humanity, all of our technology, all of our energy systems are based on this explosive, fire-based, radiating, heating, decomposing, breaking down sort of principle of nature. And that's why it's breaking down the world around us. When we shift to a water-based relationship with energy instead of a fire-based one, we start working with impulsive principles that generate energy instead of wasting it. So the solutions are free and nearly free energy from water. And some of the profoundly brilliant inventors that created uh, inventions and solutions around water-based energy is Stanley Myers, Victor Schauberger, Tesla, and his later work, his much later writing, um, and Gil Brown, and I'm sure some others, and at least one or two or three of those have been quote-unquote mysteriously suicided. Um, okay, so how about medicine? This is an area that really um, fascinates me personally. I've been diving deep into the study of water's life and hydration is health for three years. And every which way I look at it, there is just a direct correlation between the quality of water in our bodies and the quality of our health and the length of our life. So water is life, right? Medicine aims to save lives and improve the quality of life. So health really is saving and improving the quality of hydration and that's what our medicine should be based on as well after all it's 999 out of every one of, out of every thousand of your water mo of your molecules is water then well, maybe that's at least 99.9% .9 the most effective method or vehicle of, of health and medicine and yet our whole medical paradigm is based on that one percent that that one molecule out of a thousand point one percent okay it's based only on the volumes and not on the solution so our issue according to the world health organization worldwide is caused by unclean drinking water. And the other 20% is also linked to dehydration. And when I'm talking about dehydration, I'm not talking about how much water you drink. That actually surprisingly has little to do with hydration. And um, you know, a lot of people are actually even drinking water that's actively dehydrating them because it's an aggressive solvent. It's unstructured, it takes more energy for the body to structure it, and it gives back to the body and hydroelectric energy. It can strip the body of um, hydrating minerals and electrolytes. When I'm speaking about hydration, it really has much more to do with the phase or the, the crystallinity of the water in your body. It has to do with the mineral profile of the water in your body, which should be just about exactly the same as oceanic marine plasma. Your blood plasma and oceanic marine plasma have basically the exact same mineral ratios when you're healthy, right? Or the same as the ocean was during the Cambrian period when vertebrates first left the ocean. In fact, your cerebral spinal fluid, for example, is only one molecule different from seawater. So it needs to have an oceanic composition of, of minerals, also the isotopic composition, or how many neutrons are in each hydrogen atom. So if we're talking about uh, deuterium hydrogen or protium hydrogen, um, also the ability of water in your body to flow and change phases, uh, change phases, change states, to flow easily in between your, your blood and your, lymph your lymphatic fluid, or in between your blood and your cerebral spinal fluid, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, how well does your body water mirror the hydrological cycles of Mother Earth? Because you have all of the same hydrological cycles within you in slightly different ways that the Earth has externally. So that's what I mean when I say hydration. Um, so we could say that pretty much all, you know, 80% of disease linked to unclean drinking water, the other 20% linked to dehydration. Our shifted relationship is to understand what all indigenous people no, everywhere around the world. It's like the most primary recognition of, of being human. It's our, our most primary understanding is that water is nature's original medicine, right? But we've forgotten that. We've, we've come very far from that in the print. And as science has begun to tap back into that wisdom, there have been so many incredible solutions in the field of medicine, like amazingly healing water therapies 
more than I could even list here on the slide. Double helix water, deuterium depleted water, pencil marine plasma, molecular hydrogen water, magnetized water, and other water therapies like mapping and balneology, etc. All of which have a very long and well studied history of research. Now, let's look at agriculture. So, Currently, 70% of water worldwide is used in agriculture, which means that if we were to address agricultural water use, that alone would be enough to vastly mitigate the water crisis that we're in. It's so important because um, water demand is expected to exceed current supply by 40%. By 2030, in eight years, we can beat it by 40%. And I'm sure most of you guys have heard this statistic already, that by the year 2050, it's expected that one out of two people won't have access to clean water. There's a lot that we can do about that, and we shift our relationship to water. So the big issue here, and the reason why so much water is used and, in fact, wasted in agriculture is because flood irrigation wastes 50 to 80 percent of water to seepage and evaporation, plus it overtills the soil, which is then carried away by the wind, which then there's, you know, and the water can soak into the soil as well. And yet still, even with all of this, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization are still promoting this model of flood irrigation in the developing world. Now this is really, really critical because if we were to address agricultural water uses, that alone would be enough to solve the global water crisis and thereby halt climate change. Now we're going to get to that in a minute, the climate change issue. But our shifted relationship here is really comprehend and copy nature, which was Victor Schauberger's catchphrase. I think it was in fact his family motto or something like that. Um, and it's so important because nature has already created the perfect model for nourishing ecosystems. We can't copy that in our agricultural practices. So some of the solutions, and there are so many, but some of the ways that we can work with water's intelligence, how she wants to be treated, is magnetized water and structured water. And I'm not going to go over all of this. Feel free to take a screenshot. Um, I know that you guys will be at sent a recording of this as well, so you'll be able to revisit it. Um, but basically, these are some of the effects of using magnetized water and structured water, um, reducing the requirements for irrigation, reducing the energy requirements, vastly reducing the use of chemicals and pesticides and that sort of thing. And some of the studies that have been done on, on um, crop yields with these are just really, really beautiful, not just with crops, but also um, with animal husbandry as well. In fact, with magnetized water, there was this one study that showed that feeding cows magnetized water actually increased their rate of milk production more than RGBH, which is the hormone that cows are given to increase their milk production, and yet it has horrific effects on uh, on people who drink that water on their endocrine systems and hormonal imbalances and things like that. So water alone holds the keys to this. You see here, a crop watered with magnetic water as opposed to normal water. You can see here, watered with structured water as opposed to unstructured water. And here are a few more solutions to improve agricultural use, like molecular hydrogen, which specifically helps in alleviating plant stress from drought, from heavy metals, from salinity, et cetera. It also slows crop senescence. Of course, the super brilliant ways is biodynamic farming uses water preparations as fertilizers and as kind of like natural pest repellents. And super genius water saving and water recycling tactics, just like permaculture farming, and there's some really interesting research regarding the various bandwidths of the light spectrum that you expose water to. I think we need a lot more research into this. It's, it's kind of um, fringe. I only found one source that had studied it, but we need more people to study this if anybody feels inspired to. Um, so you can actually increase the soil's inherent levels of certain minerals. So, for example, if you expose the water to green light, it'll create more nitrogen in the soil. If you expose water to yellow light, it's going to have more magnesium in the soil, etc. So you can actually nourish the soil 
according to your needs as an agriculturalist without fertilizers in that way. And there's also a TED talk about how plasma activated water can act as a natural pesticide and boost soil fertility and crop yields, etc. So, as Mr. Schauberger said, the biggest environmental disaster is our failing to understand the need to protect the quality of water. He called it, he really called it, he knew over a hundred years ago, he predicted the, the um, conundrum that we would be in right now, the climate conundrum that we would be in. Interestingly, he also predicted the global intelligence and emotional um, health and mental capacity would fast decline based solely on the way that we were treating water and the kind of immature water that people were beginning to drink um, in his era. Uh, but that's another topic for another time. He, he predicted the climate disasters that we're having solely based on the way that we treat water. And thankfully, he also laid out some patterns to, um, to prevent and also to heal and change that. Now, notice he said quality, not quantity. Because it's not just about how much water is in the region, right? It's about whether that water is living and energized or not, whether she is healthy, whether she is mature, whether she is happy. Um, and, and we in the Western world tend to just focus on the quantity, like how much water is in this well, you know, how much water does this uh, crop need to grow, etc. Dams, diversions, pollution, and basically every way that we currently interact with water deadens and devitalizes her. It leaves her devoid of structure, of energy, and of quality. So natural water keeps her out healthy through hydrological cycles. That's her life cycle. That's what she needs to, to grow and be a full, well-rounded, intelligent being with a lot to give, with a generous nature, right? When we're not taking from her, she has a very generous nature. That's how she supports all of life. Where colonized water has lost its diversity. So when that happens, areas dry up and we see greater desertification, which leads to higher temperatures. Okay, let's take a look at solutions that water provides to the climate crisis. So, as Dr. James Perkinson said, climate change is not, first of all, a problem to be solved, but a communication to be heard. And it is especially a communication of water. So the issue that we're facing is that depletion of the hydrological cycle raises temperatures and raises CO2. And I highly recommend the work of Dr. Walter Jenne, J-H-E-N-E, for anyone who's interested in, um, in the climate science of hydrological restoration. Because from global scale phase changes to fluctuating sea surface temperatures to cloud microphysics to atmospheric regulation across the board. Water is basically the intermediary between the sun and the planet's ecology. Let me say that again. Water is the intermediary between the sun and the planet's ecology. When water disappears, there's no intermediary, there's no interface, there's no communication point, and the sun has no way of healthfully interacting with the planet's ecology, and it becomes detrimental. So when we disrupt water cycles, temperatures rise, right? It's, it's that simple. Less water means higher temperature. Taking from one watershed and giving to another, draining groundwater with no replenishment, the whole virtual water trade phenomenon, water diversion, water relocation, all of these basically disregard the water's capacity or the capacity of each unique watershed. And in instead, it values our needs above the needs of water. It values our greed above uh, giving to the watershed. And that's what creates desertification. Privatizing water is directly implicated in the climate crisis. Ownership of and objectification of water, including pipes and pumps and stagnant reservoirs, they're all antithetical to the nature of water, which is a common. It's shared by the bloodstreams of a watershed, and this has become a very, um, a very abusive relationship. A very abusive relationship. So it's no wonder that she's disappearing, right? She should. She's being mistreated. Her needs are not being considered. There's no communication. She's not being listened to. There's, there's no generosity. There's nothing but greed. So, I mean, anyone would leave a relationship like that. Water stewards life. 
So if we value water, we have to place her needs above our own so that she can keep life on Earth in balance. Because carbon mediates less than 5% of the total energy in the atmosphere. 90% of the total energy is governed by the Earth's hydrology. We're really just chasing our own tails with this whole focusing on greenhouse gases first thing. The more water is in a watershed, the more it itself extracts greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and neutralizes them. For every gram of water that a plant transpires, it reduces atmospheric heat by 600 calories. For every one gram of carbon that a plant draws down, its soil can retain an extra eight grams of water. Water cycles can be restored much, fast, much, much faster than soil sequestration can reduce atmospheric carbon levels. Drawing down atmospheric carbon is important, but it could take centuries, even if we were to reach zero carbon emissions right now. So it's just not a very effective place to be placing our energy, although it is a very profitable place to be placing our energy. There's a lot of investment there happening. There's a lot of, you know, it's kind of keeping the, the economy going uh, more than general the water share would. Because water can store, move, and transfer heat better than anything else. We solve the hydrological crisis, we will solve the climate crisis. That's why we have to start taking water more seriously. In a climate change of increased CO2, only water has the potential of either enhancing or mitigating global warming because water is the primary vehicle that redistributes the sun's energy around the planet. It's a transducer and it's a conveyor. So the more we deplete groundwater, the more CO2 will rise. The more we replenish groundwater, the more CO2 will fall. In fact, water is the only molecule that is able to affect the planet's climate on short time scale. Say that part again. Water is the only molecule that is able to affect the planet's climate on short time scale. When we decide our future to see water as life, we realize that water is the primary cause of a dying planet. You poop too? Okay. Where did you put the bag? Oh, okay. Um, I don't want to put in the trash here, but if you just put it out the front door and then we'll take it on the way out. I found ginger for you. It's right there in your cup. to restore soil and plant life is to 
water stays within its watershed and its quality is uplifted and confined there. So water has to be respected and managed at the watershed level because water falls on the earth in a dispersed way, right? And because every living being needs water, so decentralized management and the democratic ownership of biomimicry based water are the only efficient, reasonable, and equitable systems. Because beyond the space and the market, beyond the power of the community, beyond the bureaucracy, in the words of uh, water activist named Maud Barlow, I highly recommend her work. So by learning directly from water, by becoming her student, we can turn deserts into forests. Okay, so how do we see water? As a commodity or as a cost? As a resource or as a fee source? By objectifying and commodifying her, we create conditions of scarcity, drought, disease, and war. As World Bank Vice President said, the wars of the 21st century will be fought over oil, the wars of the 21st century will be fought over water. Because when the source of life is exploited as a source of capital, those who can afford to buy water have the right to live, and those who can't afford it have the right to die of thirst and waterborne diseases. Now check this out. The bottled water industry as a whole is worth about $100 billion annually. But it would only take about $15 billion to solve the whole world water crisis. Only 15% of just the, just the bottled water industry's profits. But they won't do so. No one will do so as long as we see water as a commodity to buy, sell, and trade as an inanimate object. Because then, for scarcity, makes their private water assets more valuable. examples of relational paradigms that work really well, where water, and of course it varies all over the world, and not lumping all indigenous cultures into one umbrella, they have their own beautiful nuances, because again, each and every watershed has its own unique expressions and personalities and needs. But here are the themes that we see throughout them, which is that water has her own agency, her own decision-making, her own prerogative, and each body of water is considered a sentient and living being. So the Kogi of Colombia, for example, I am just so in awe of their water teachings. They know that within water is the metaphysical blueprint of existence. They say it holds the map of reality, all worlds of reality, from dreams to the structures of daily life, memories of the past, probability fields of future timelines, psychic visions, all of these are maintained by water, right? It's as if each drop of water is a hologram of the whole universe. And the Kobe Mamos are basically like their shaman, say that we need to give generously to water with physical offerings, with prayers, with praises, with our energy, with our intention, with our work. I call it pagamento. It's like the rent that we pay to drive these bodies of water that we drive, to, to borrow this drop of water that we call our body, to borrow it from the watershed for one lifetime. And then it goes right back to the watershed again. And we get to pay rent for that. The Balinese call it Tirta Chamangfari. I had the great honor of studying with uh, some Balinese priests for over a year out in Indonesia during the pandemic. And every single day, Balinese people craft beautiful baskets full of flowers and incense and offerings of fruit and candy. And they place prayers by every river and every pool and even on jugs of water dispensers. Every place that there is water, they place offerings every day. And extra offerings on holidays. And there's like 30 holidays a month there. <laughs> Constantly holidays. But you find this offering practice in countless, countless indigenous cultures. And this is really something for us to, to start leaning into more. How can we give to water? How can we give? So I really invite you to align with nature by giving you the water as well. Put your time, your attention, your praise, your offering, your energy. It's not about what she can do for us. It's not about how we can use her. 
And I promise you, when we start shifting that paradigm to what can we give to her, she will start returning and giving back to us far more than we could ever cajole her into doing by the manipulative methods that we're currently trying to use to modify her. Okay, so how do we do this practically? All that spiritual stuff is very nice, but let's get practical. How can we do this, right? Well, start by asking questions. It's the basis of any good relationship, right? We want to get to know each other. We want to ask each other questions. We want to start a dialogue. So where does your drinking water come from? Where does its waste go? What is your watershed called? Just like we know our own address, we should know our watershed. It's more real than any man-made borders or maps. We want to know the borders of our watershed. We want to know where its springs are. We want to know if there is a fresh cold spring where you can harvest your drinking water. You can go to findaspring.com and start harvesting fresh, raw, wild, living, undomesticated water. Powerful power that since 2009. It's the most literally the most transformative uh, thing that I've, I've ever done. Um, I've just been drinking from fresh springs since then, so for about uh, 15 years now. So start by asking yourself these questions, right? Can you make your bloodstream from the bloodstream of your local ecology? Remember, good relationships start with curiosity. They start with communication. We start with humbling ourselves. We call our internal circulation blood, and we call our external circulation water. But really, they're not separate. The water is inside of us as the water is outside of us. And when we understand that they're one and the same, we can start to commune and collaborate with watersheds in profound ways that open new worlds of possibility. So here are some things that we can do. Where activism and guardianship think globally. So think globally and act locally, right? As living beings, we're made of 99% water molecules. What is our role on this earth as expressions of water itself? So one thing is to consider your virtual water footprint. So, for example, it takes one gram of water to grow one single almond. It takes 400 um, for one pound of coffee. It takes 37 for one cup of coffee. That's 10 tons of water for one pound of coffee. Sorry, not quite. I think it takes one gallon of water to grow one single. It'd be great if it only took a gram of water, wouldn't it, to grow a single almond? I don't have any issues. No, it takes a gallon of water to grow a single almond. And most of the almonds that we eat are grown in California, which is already incredibly water starved. So we would need to start looking at this global footprint. I mean, 10 tons of water for one for one pound of coffee is obnoxious. So really, we need to start um, considering the whole water trade and sourcing locally as just humanly possible. Get to know your local farmer, your local growers, your local gardeners. Really, the most important thing we can do is to support our indigenous water protectors. You know, they were the original water stewards and are still some of the most active and engaged water stewards on the planet. The Dakota Access Pipeline got a lot of press and attention, and it was installed anyway. But currently in the United States alone, there are about 97 other pipelines, 97 other pipelines being installed with no press. So get to know whose land you're on and how you can support them. You can irrigate your land with rainwater, um, Dig water retention ponds. This is a great one if you or your family has land. Just dig big holes where the water can cool up and seep in. Grow hardy plants that don't need much water. Um, here's a big one. Just attend your local city hall meetings, right? Find out if they are toxic chemicals on your local um, public spaces, your local public gardens. And it's really easy to make a difference at that level. You would be surprised. That's kind of fun. You can get involved with the meetings of your state's water conservation board. You could host a screening for your friends and family of a documentary like Blue Gold or Faux or Tapped or Last Call of the Oasis. You can host a fundraiser. I love hosting fundraisers. It's one of my favorite things. It's such a fun way to get everybody involved and, you know, mix together a little hedonism and a little altruism. 
But no matter what you do, make sure that your actions are grounded in the real world and not just the echo chambers of cyberspace. It's, we get this momentary dopamine hit of satisfaction when we think we're being engaged by posting something on social media, but it's really important to just get out in the real world with real people and engage with real water. All right, I invite you to take a screenshot of this. These are some great organizations and foundations doing great work. They're certainly by no means the only ones. There are so many good ones, but um, these are some of my favorites. And finally, I want to tell you a little story. So there's the story about how the gods were unsure of where to hide the secrets of life and the birth of universe, and they tried to it high, and they tried hiding it low, and yet they knew that humans, with all their ingenuity and their boundless curiosity, would surely find the secret of life on any mountaintop or in any stone, and so they decided to hide it in the one place that humans would never think to look, which was inside the people themselves. And it's true, we are created as the most powerful force in the universe, the most magnificent mystery is hidden within each one of us. The secret of life itself comes within every one of our molecules. And it's my prayer that humanity will awaken to the awareness that we are water. Water is us. There's no difference. What we do to the waters outside of us, we do to ourselves. Again, what we do to water, we do to ourselves. If you take nothing else away from this whole chat, please let that sink into your bones. What we do to water, we do to ourselves. Water is the mirror that reflects us back to ourselves, right? And her fate becomes our destiny. That's how Schauberger was able to make the predictions that he did over a hundred years ago. Because he knew that what we would do to water would suffer the consequences of. What we do to water, we do to ourselves. And I'll just leave you with this last thought, which is a little bit unrelated, but water, well, this is, so this, in the middle here is the quote-unquote cosmic web, right? This is what astronomers think the universe looks like. What does it kind of look like? It kind of looks like light ripples on water, right? Water is the manifest form of the unmanifest. Water is the mediator between the human and the heavenly. heavenly. When we interact with water, we are touching the force of creation itself. We are touching the body of life itself. We are influencing the entire cosmos based on that principle of quantum entanglement that we discussed in the very beginning. When we touch water, we are interacting with this incredible cosmic force, with every interaction that we have with water. And just as the ancients taught us, water may be the closest approximation that we have to the body of God, the body of the Creator, that which forms and fills and fuels every living being. And I invite you just to be there. What would change if we started to see water the way? So after we hop off this call, we're going to take some questions. We're going to have some conversation. But after we hop off this call, take some time. I invite you to just journal, just jot down some thoughts of, you know, if, if anything um, resonated with you from this. And specifically the question, what would change if we started to see water that way? Wow. I am. Oh, just one, one quick last thing. Um, and as a friend, this is where you can find me. Stuart asked me to share with you a little bit about a couple of the offerings that I have available. Um, I think, Stuart, you've been in a couple of my courses now, right? I have been, yes. And I'm really eager for our emissaries to know about the resources that you have on your website and the courses, the content. Uh, if you want to just talk about them really briefly or even better, maybe put something in the chat so um, people can just access them through that. And I, I, one, I want to thank you, Isabel, for you <laughs> being so watery, flowing, abundant, and uh, always returning to the source. And there's a lot of information that you brought forward that I, I bet was pretty overwhelming. And... Um, I, w I want to open this up to questions, comments, because this is for you, uh, all the emissaries. We want to have you engage and asking questions or making whatever comments you have and um, for us to begin to deepen our connection to water, which is deepening our connection to self. 
So I, a couple of people we know have had to leave and understand that with the amount of time that we've had. Um, yet we'd love to have you just popcorn style jump in there and ask whatever questions that you have of Isabel or of Kalani. I'm not sure if Kalani's still here, but if so. Kalani's here. Thank you, brother. Um, I guess I have a question um, for Isabel. Thank you so much. Also, that was a really um, awesome talk and a lot of stuff that I'd never thought of or, or learned before. So thank you. Um, but I was just thinking about this concept of like the natural, I forget exactly what you called it, but like the untitled water um, that hasn't seen like these human processes, I guess. Um, how would you propose like in an urban area, like I'm just thinking about a place like New York or something like that, like how would that water like reach like an urban population and so, like people in cities as well as like people in rural areas could like consume like this healthier, better version of water? Yeah, that's a really great question. That's actually what a lot of my work centers on. Um, for one thing, there are fresh wild springs surprisingly um, common. I actually lived in New York City for a while, and there was a spring on Staten Island where I used to go to harvest fresh spring water. Now, understanding that that is not entirely accessible to everyone, water is never dead. She is only dormant even at her sickest state. So she can always be revived and brought back to life again. There are always ways of mimicking nature to restore that vitality and that essence to her. Um, and again, we just want to mirror the hydrological cycle in the way that we do that. So um, kind of a general mm -hmm. format mm -hmm. that I teach. And again, it depends on the source water that you're starting with, whether you're starting with tap water or bottled water, you know, each one of those affects our body and our, our psychology slightly differently. Um, I teach about all this in the Navigating the Waters e-course. If you want to take a deep dive, it's only 33 bucks. I can give the emissary the uh, coupon code for that, so you can get it even cheaper. I'd be happy to. But basically, the format is filter, structure, balance, energize, and free. So filtration, you know, self-explanatory, except most filters are um, structure, so you want to bring some, some crystallinity, some cohesion to the water molecules. You want to make sure that they're forming those um, molecular clusters that are actually able to receive and transmit and transduce vibration information and frequency. This is what gives her her intelligence, water, they form and store information. For balance, that includes aeration. So again, just like we need to breathe, water needs to breathe, just like we need to eat. Water needs to eat. We both need to consume the earth element, right? We do that by eating food that's grown in the earth. She does that by having a well-balanced mineral ratio, um, getting good electrolytes in the water, good mineralogy in the water. Um, so yeah, that's like mineralogy. You could even include microbiome health in that. It's not necessarily that's another thing that you would find in natural water, natural spring water is a health And then, and then energize. So water that's in a formation stores information. We want to give her a formation and then we want to inform her. So that's the energy, the vibration, the frequency that she is then exposed to. And that's, there are a lot of different ways to take each of those steps. Um, but that's kind of the best approximation that we can probably make to mimicking nature. Cool. Thank you very much. That was a good question. Um, I had a question. Um, first, I wanted to say um, thank you, Kalani, for the prayer at the beginning. It was very beautiful. And I want to say thank you, Isabel, for your presentation. Very engaging, um, especially the conversation about how scarcity is not a product of nature. I thought that that was a really key part of the presentation. Um, one question that I did have was, what exactly is magnetized and structured water? Um, if you have time, I'm just curious. Yeah, totally. So magnetized water is, is just what it sounds like. It's, it's water that's been exposed to a, a strong magnetic field. So there have been certain studies that have shown that, for example, you know, water that goes to the South Pole, if you feed that to mice, the mice are going to be much smaller, not as strong, but really smart and really fast. And if you uh, let the mice drink water that has been exposed to the North Pole, they 
won't be quite as smart, they'll be kind of dumb, but they'll be really strong, right? And they'll grow really big. And, you know, do we want to be small and smart or strong and dumb? Well, neither. We want to be balanced. Right? <laughs> so when you get a balance of dipolar magnetism, because the water molecule itself is dipolar, right? It has a north pole and a south pole. So when water passes through these strong magnetic fields, the dipolar molecules start all aligning in the same direction, and it helps with the structure. Um, for anyone looking deeper into that, I recommend checking out some of the studies that have been done in Israel with magnetized water. Um, and, and like their chickens are, I don't know, like I think for them, I guess it's amazing. Um, and also, you know, the Russians have been on this water trip for years long. They call it, they call it wonder water. I don't know if it's water, wonder water. Um, anyway, then structured water, basically, again, it has to do with the connection of the water molecules. So when we have bulk or unstructured water, and in labs we call it bulk water, and that's where the molecules are bouncing around like a mosh pit, right? It's insane. The hydrogen bonds are breaking apart a billion times per second. There's no time for them to create a crystallinity of sacred geometry that allows them to channel these vibratory forces of nature, right? Um, so there are a lot of different ways to structure water, but the point behind it is basically that, you know, just like we need healthy relationships in our lives to form healthy families, to form healthy communities, to form healthy cultures, to form healthy nations, water molecules need to get together, form healthy relationships, to form healthy families, you know, well, they form healthy families that we call like a molecular cluster, and then cultures that we would call these, you know, beautiful snowflake crystalline geometries that start to spread in these fractaline ways and then you get really healthy, communicative, well balanced water when it's when it's more structured. Thank you. There's also um, Dr. Russell Roy had this beautiful analogy that I, I really love for structured water. He says the molecules of water are kind of like the alphabet. And with the twenty six or twenty seven letters in the alphabet. With only 26 or 27 letters, we can basically write all of the sonnets of Shakespeare and like the whole history of everything in the universe, right, um, that's ever been written. Or just with the ones and zeros of computer coding, we can have every cat picture on the internet. Well, the molecular, if it's based on the way that those come together, it's based on the patterns of the way that those come together. Otherwise, it's just kind of an alphabet soup that makes no sense. Well, most of the water that is unstructured, the molecules are like an alphabet soup. But when they come together in a certain way, they can channel a lot of really intelligent information. Yeah. There's a great book by Thomas Schwenk that I think is on the um, waterinno.com website. But if not, I'll make sure that we add that. That talks about the structuring of water and magnetism of water. And um, West, at some point, I think uh, you you probably can weigh in on that and share some insights about that as well. Yeah, West is a master. Don't ask me. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, Theodore uh, Schwenk was uh, uh, another uh, naturalist, so he he knew the, he knew water not from extrinsic. That is, it is the lifeblood of of the earth, and maybe of the universe. I mean, you know, water is for talk is is most involved in things like the gas clouds come together um, and don't heat up too much. It's cool enough to actually um, produce a star, um, and um, even some of the interstellar space, like amorphous ice. Um, so uh, to have brought the uh, initial uh, kinds of um, compounds to Earth that uh, were likely the, the beginning of, of biological uh, biological organisms on, on this planet. So, yeah, it, as far as someone who really intimately knew water from an experiential uh, kind of viewpoint, I think uh, Schwenk is is certainly one of the best. Thank you, Wes. Any other questions?
No more? Okay, Madeline, Caroline, you want to wrap things up and talk about just uh, Thursday and what we're going to be doing on Thursday? Good. Please go ahead. Um, it's not necessarily related to water specifically, but I'm just curious to see how you guys um, think about water and how it connects to food security um, or insecurity. If you just briefly talk about it, because I I know um, I'm trying to understand. I, I don't know. Just trying to broaden my perspective about um, how we pee water, and so I'm trying to see how that would work in this context. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll be happy to address that. I mean, water is intimately related to food security. The more water in an area, the more food that we can produce. Right? Water is privatized, and only the people who can afford to pay for water can afford to water their crops. There are a lot of farmers who are out of work. You know, there are some places, I guess it was in Malaysia. But, you know, it's a thing. In some places, farmers come into their their fields armed with pickaxes to literally fight one another over the dwindling water in, in the wells there that has been run dry by corporations like Coke and others that have just come in and privatized the water, and now there's nothing left for the farmers, so there's not this food insecurity in these places. And in most major mega cities around the world, like mega city is like a really, really big one, like Mexico City, where I am, for example. A lot of the crops are actually watered using sewage, using raw sludge, because that's the only liquid that's available. And they don't have filtration available, they can't afford to buy water, they're often drought ridden areas, so they're literally watering their crops with sewage. Um, yeah, water water security is, is directly, I would say, at the heart of and the root of food security. If we address water security in a decentralized way, in a, in a way that mimics nature's generosity, um, then food security won't be an issue. Yeah, Esther, that's a great question. And it's it's so fundamental around the globe that water is an economic issue. And underserved communities that don't have the, I'll call it political power or the lobbying power or the monetary power are being deeply impacted by the water, which has been, let's just use the the broad word, polluted. And it is an issue that is critical around the globe. It's an issue which I know Kalani has very dear to his heart. One of our well advisors, Erin Brockovich, it is her commitment in her life and her passion is serving underserved minority communities, mostly in America, and helping them with the quality of water they have. And it all gets back to water's food. So everything is grown with water, and the water that is being used to grow our food is, as Isabel referred to with sewage water, is a problem everywhere around the planet that most people never think about and have no consciousness or awareness of the impact of that water that is growing all of our food. Also to mention all the food that's being processed, that water that's being used. People just don't know and think about it. And you all are critical to understand these issues and to study these and to educate yourself and others, because this is what we need to do for the future of our health and our well-being, for our own personal health, for the health of the planet, and, of course, for the health of water. And, and that's the kind of education that we're wanting to share with you to understand its pivotal role that it plays in all of our lives. And once you understand that, we will offer you these solutions like Isabel has done, that you can take action in your own personal life where you can have water in your home that is water that is purified, water that is remineralized and re-energized. And you can share this with your friends and your community. And this all can be done economically. And we'll be sharing with you resources that you can have for your own water to be able to improve the quality of your water. And as Isabel said, the simplest thing you can do with all of your water is you can just take a spoon 
and you can spin your water and vortex it, which brings back the life, the structure of the water. And it's, it's what you can do with every time you ever have, you know, any beverage, whether it's water, tea or coffee. And then also add your own message to the water. The water receives your message. And you'll be learning about this in one of our future sessions about water receiving everything that you say, you think, as well as what you show water. It receives that message. So there's a lot of opportunities and ways for you to connect with water and to revitalize and energize your water so it is providing the vitality and health and well-being for your body, your mind, and your spirit or your soul. So any other questions? Well, thank you for sticking around as long as you have. Really grateful for that and so grateful for Kalani joining us today, for Isabel leading us, and for each of you participating and sharing time. Because that's the valuable thing that, you know, we have in our time. And we're looking forward to our um, time on Thursday. Madeline, you want to share what Thursday's session is going to be? Um, thank you so much, Stuart, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thursday is going to be a panel about intersectionality in water, more focused on sort of the tangibles of water access and the role that your identity, whether it's you know, religion, gender, ethnicity, plays in your access to water on a global scale. So we have some really awesome people coming in to talk about that. Um, and we will also be sending out an email, again, with information about the emissary portal and the group me link, and then the recording for this session will also be available for you as well. Wonderful. Any any parting words, uh, Kalani? Yeah. Drink water. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Mahalo. Right. Is, Be is, safe. Isabel? Just thank you to everyone for caring about water and for uh, spending your time and your energy and your love to mm. be here and to learn and you're all just going to do such amazing beautiful things in your lives so I'm excited for that so thank you mm -hmm. thank you and I want to thank Madeline and Caroline and West and Didier who wasn't with us today and let's see who else that's been, been part of the emissaries that's been so active Everyone else who's been part of this community, we're all in this together, and we're grateful that we're all sharing this time and this community that we're building, which is honoring water and her sacredness. So we'll look forward to speaking with you on Thursday. Aloha. <laughs>